So, okay. Well, lovely to be here. Thank you so much. Um, the ADA have asked me whether I have a perspective as the leader of the Australian Law Reform Commission Digital Agenda Copyright Review on Australia's appetite for copyright reform. And I will answer that from the ALRC Commissioner perspective. But, but the story for me begins almost two decades ago as a member of the Ergus Review, also known as the Intellectual Property Competition Review Committee. And so I'm going to refer not only to copyright, but also to IP law generally and to competition law to elucidate what I see as the reform agenda to date. I'm not going to talk about what's ahead because I know that's coming. Um, and uh, let's just start with a little bit of... Um, oh, sorry. Um, I, you notice I didn't put my subtitle on my own slides. Um, text lies and stereotypes, it's uh, plagiarism appropriation, misappropriation from a movie title. Um, but I hope that you will see what it means as we go on. Okay, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a quick sweep through uh, reform activity over the last 20 years, then some reflection on the processes and barriers to what, what seems like sensible reform. But first of all, the cup is half full. And this slide merely mentions, I'm not going to talk about them, a couple of very recent reforms that you'd all be aware of. And we are seeing in particular, I'm pleased to say, Ruth, some benefits for the GLAM sector. The, uh, the, I love that acronym. I met it first at the ALRC review. Um, galleries, libraries, archives and museums. So. Um, we are actually meeting in this beautiful National Library and we are, we are seeing more benefits, I think. However, um, a lot of... Um, I was checking my slides when Ruth was talking and she mentioned that reform is in bits and pieces and, uh, and that is true. There's actually a lot of copyright reform, but it tends to be, as I say here, in bits and pieces. However, it can be very enduring. For example, the emergency introduction of protection for software, defining it as a literary work in 1984. This 1984 innovation was intended as a temporary measure. It was even described as a sunset provision. It would sink below the horizon while we thought of some better way to protect software. But of course, it's still there and it's been surprisingly enduring. But let's think about this for a moment. Is wholesale reform a good idea? What we haven't seen in copyright and I'm, I'm glad you said this too, Ruth. Um, not easy following you on the podium. <laughs> what we haven't seen in copyright is the introduction of major reform or a new Copyright Act. We have had a new Patents Act in 1990. We got a new Trademarks Act in 1995. There's been no shortage of reviewing of copyright law, and there was even a dedicated review body at one time, the Copyright Law Review Committee. And this slide just outlines a few of the activities of the CLRC, including the extremely um, seminal inquiry into simplification of the Copyright Act. Um, and what I've put up on this slide is just a quick snapshot of the main terms of reference for the simplification reference. However, simplification is never simple. And do we want it simple or do we want it different? That's one of the questions. It's almost the 20th anniversary of the CLRC report, which came out in two parts. And in its report, the Copyright Law Review Committee adopted a very broad view of exceptions to rights. They still called it fair dealing, but they suggested the creation of two classes of subject matter creations and productions instead of the existing eight technology specific categories and the recommendations on fair dealing were to consolidate fair dealing into a single section and expand it into what they called an open-ended model not confined to the closed list of fair dealing exceptions but applying five fairness factors to all fair dealings and again referencing what Ruth said um, this looks a bit like fair use, even though it was not called that at the time. All right, the two parts of the report were described as recommending quite radical departures from the present legislation, and the recommendations on fair dealing were described as an exocet in sheep's clothing, an elegantly coiffured wolf ready to cut through the swathes of copyright owners' exclusive rights 
in the interests interest of balance. And the person that said this is Sam Rickardson. And Sam, I think, has um, thought more about fair use, fair dealing, as the years have gone by. And um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how um, everyone's thinking has moved on, perhaps. But I, I, and I don't actually think that what he said was wrong. It certainly was um, quite radical recommendations. Um, the point was made by various people that simplifying the Copyright Act would not make it simpler at all, and it could create quite unintended consequences. And as C.S. Lewis once said about reforming the Anglican prayer book, those that don't understand it will still not understand it. Those that do understand it will continue to understand it, but they will be extremely aggravated by the changes and the loss of traditional language. And in copyright law terms, I think we can say that this means that lawyers will still need to be involved and laypersons will still not understand the Copyright Act, however simple it might be. But um, there, there, there may well have been a massive transaction cost, of which I want to say a bit more later. All right, so what happened next after the Copyright Law Review Committee, um, which was abolished? Over the last two decades, we've had an increasing opening up and deregulation of the Australian economy. And successive federal governments have pursued national competition policy in particular in the interest of making the Australian business more effective and productive. And in the early 1990s, a specific trigger for reviewing the interface between intellectual property and competition law came about with the Hilmer Review. And this slide just um, mentions the things I'm going to be talking about. I won't go through the slide as such. Um, the Hilmer Review was established in October 1992 and it inquired into national competition policy to try and identify opportunities for microeconomic reform and uh, allow the Australian economy to blossom in a more open and contestable world forum. It led to a lot of significant changes. Uh, the Hilmer Report uh, looked at intellectual property but only in one paragraph because they said it's too complex, it needs its own review. And this review was, of course, the Ergus Review, the Intellectual Property Competition Review Committee. So the Ergus Review reported in 2000, and among the recommendations um, was the repeal of Section 51.3 of the Trade Practices Act, now called Section 51.3 of the Consumer and Competition Act, and also the demolition of prohibition on parallel importing, and there were some other recommendations too. It wasn't all about copyright, it was about um, intellectual property generally. I'm going to, again, return to some of these things. Since then, we've had the House of Representatives IT Pricing Inquiry, one of my favourite reports, um, as I'll tell you in a minute. The Harper Review in 2014, the ALRC Review in 2014, and the Productivity Commission in 2017. So the IT pricing inquiry took place in the House of Representatives, as I said, in 2013, and it found that despite a lot of complaints about pirating of copyright material, technological change had not, in fact, harmed the market for IT products. This may be a, a radical statement, contested by many, but that's what they said. And they certainly did not accept that the market was being decimated, as, as was being claimed. So this report in the House of Representatives coined the phrase, the Australia tax. And just to remind you what that means, a lot of data was presented to the inquiry to show that Australians were paying a lot more for IT products, uh, products protected by copyright. So music was typically 67% more expensive for Australian consumers than in the US. Games, 61% more expensive e-books, 13% more expensive, software, 49% more, hardware, 26 more. And the inquiry recommended legislatively banning geo-blocking, which is an electronic form of prohibiting parallel importing. Now, I, I just note, we will all know, I think, that since this time, pri since this inquiry, prices have come down a lot. Kindle books, for example, seem to be the same in Australian dollars as they are in US dollars. I make a, I make a lot of comparisons of this. Um, we didn't have Netflix at this time, but Netflix has 
a lot of con a lot more content available than when it first um, got going. Now its business is up and running, and importantly, competition has made the market more level for Australian purchasers. So I don't think we're paying as much Australia tax as we used to, but there is still some. Then there was the Harper review. The Harper review was oh, looking again at competition issues. And it recommended that all, or nearly all, parallel importing prohibitions should be abolished and consumers, in fact, should be educated about getting around geoblocks. Now, you're starting to see reviews recommending the same things. So what happened to those recommendations? The Harper Review further recommended something very interesting, which was have an intellectual property review. And they thought an overarching review of IP by an independent body such as the Productivity Commission should, um, should, should take place. And this recommendation came out around the time the ALRC was doing its work. And I felt like saying to them, what do you think we are doing? But we weren't, we weren't actually doing a wholesale look at competition. We were, we were looking, as you know, the terms of reference were confined to certain aspects of copyright law. All right, so the Harper Review wanted the Productivity Commission or some such body to look at competition policy issues in intellectual property technology markets. Also, around that time, the ALRC report made recommendations about orphan works, government use of works, use by libraries and archives, and of course, fair use. And then the Productivity Commission recommended implementing the ALRC report. Well, at least that's my, that's my summary of it, um, on copyright amendments. And there have, in fact, been some amendments resulting from these reviews. And also, um, other developments include we've seen more and more fair trade agreements. And the innovation and science agenda of the current federal government, um, which also relies heavily on copyright um, and competition generally being part of that equation. So, there's this phrase, stuck in an infinite loop. I've taken this from the title of a piece written by Cathy Bowery for The Conversation now two years ago. Um, it does seem that, as far as major reform of copyright law goes, we've been somewhat stuck. Um, and, it, and, and as Cathy points out in that article, copyright is no longer seen as a standalone issue. It relates to competition policy, economic and trade policy generally. So, we have seen some changes. But what about uh, overall reform? Well, the modern approach to legislation is to apply regulatory theory to modern legislative drafting. And what we are supposed to see in, in modern statutes is principles-based drafting, not statutes that are hidebound with a thousand specific rules. So what chance is there of proper holistic copyright reform or even major bits of reform according to these principles? Well, the ALRC, of course, thought that introducing fair use would conform to a standards approach. In asking of the use of any copyright material, is this fair, rather than does this fit within a specific rule, a number of principles or fairness factors must be considered, including, of course, the explicit need to protect rights holders' markets. So we, would, we argued in the ALRC report that fair use allows the right questions to be asked. One of the things said about copyright law is it's so complex already, it's already uncertain. Don't add to that uncertainty. But there is a lot of complexity already that is dealt with through contracts, and arrangements and guidelines and codes. In fact, much of the use of copyright material now is the result of negotiated arrangements rather than through this, the, the application of a set of rigid rules. So one question to ask is, does copyright reform that we're seeing now conform to the current overall reform approach? And I would suggest to you that examples of principles-based reform would include the abolition of all prohibitions on parallel importing, which has been recommended by various reviews. And we are seeing more and more of it, but it is in bits and pieces. Um, the major reform took place, again, many years ago, and that 
that was the watering down of amendments to book importing provisions. Um, the abolition of Section 51.3 of the Competition and Consumer Act has been recommended by anybody that's ever looked into it. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that later if I assess that you can hang out to morning tea while I, while I talk about Section 51.3. The introduction of fair use, of course, has been recommended by numerous reviews, uh, but it's never been implemented nor accepted by government, or has it? We, we might hear more about that today. So these examples I'm suggesting to you would remove a specific set of rules, a, a specific rule or set of rules, and leave assessment of the activity under scrutiny to some broad-based <coughs> principles. All right, now let's think about what objections there are to reform. And on the slide, you can see the sorts of things that review bodies hear um, constantly. Um, Let's look at some of these in more detail. First of all, the safety blanket. Um, I need my safety blanket. It's not something that it's actually said to... Uh, all, all the other things um, are actually used in talking to review bodies. I need my safety blanket. It's not the actual phrase used, but I first saw it in the Intellectual Property Competition Review Committee almost two decades ago, and it reflects a strong desire to leave things as they are. The arguments are that despite difficulties, people and business get on with things. And changing legislation will remove the safety blanket that is now giving people a lot of warm and cuddly comfort. So I'm just going to talk about Section 51.3 uh, um, for a moment. Um, it's now Section 51.3 of the Consumer and Competition Act. And it exempts the imposing of or giving effect to conditions of licenses and assignments from certain other sections of the Act to the extent that those conditions relate to the subject matter of the relevant intellectual property right. In other words, Section 51.3 exempts IP licenses and assignments from certain competition rules. And I'm not, I won't go into all of that. You'll be grateful this morning. Um, but it does give some protection to intellectual property licensing, where the content of the licensing is about IP. So the IPCRC attempted to identify the actual effect of Section 51.3 in legal terms, rather than psychological terms. We learnt a lot about the psychological effect, but little else. Part of the committee's budget was spent obtaining advice on the meaning and operation of Section 51.3 from the Australian Government Solicitor. Uh, and in its advice, the AGS highlighted the lack of clarity as to which conduct is exempted and what is actually meant by Section 51.3. And the ambiguity of that section, there is some case law but very little, meant that the scope of the exemption has been subject to a range of interpretations. In other words, no one knows what it meant. Um, if you, if you do, to be fair, um, I'm talking about some time ago now there, it has continued in use. If you look at the uh, websites of various law firms, you will see um, an explanation of, of some ways in which Section 51.3 might be useful. Um, but it's very difficult to find out exactly what it means. So it became very clear during the conduct of the Ergus Review that the way people perceive and feel about things is almost more important than the formal operation of the laws being reviewed. And I'd go as far as to say that most of the, some of the most strongly argued representations were based on emotion. Other, other arguments are based on practicality. Don't try and fix what ain't broke. And this was said about other parts of the review, for example, with respect to um, prohibitions on peril and importing, but it was particularly true of Section 51.3. So, in summary, Section 51.3 is seen as creating a safer licensing environment where license agreements relate to the subject matter of intellectual property. And almost everyone says that's good for investment, both local and overseas. Uh, we can be confident about the way we go about things. If it's changed, we'll have to think about it and look at it. Um, and as I'm arguing to you this morning, um, this is all without knowing what Section 
actually does. But whatever it is, people like it, and so it's useful. Now, over the last 20 years, there has never been a review that has not recommended getting rid of Section 51.3. The Productivity Commission, the Harper Review, the Hilmer Review, the Ergus Review. The, uh, and the Intellectual Property Community over the last 20 years has refused to countenance the tidying away of Section 51.3. What would the alternative be if it were repealed? Well, intellectual property licensing and assignment would re-emerge as a, as a scheme subject to general competition principles, and that probably would work. Um, but a, let alone repealing it, it's been plonked into the CCA. All right, it used to be Section 51.3 in the Trade Practices Act. It is of such reverential, state, revered status um, that it's now called Section 51.3 in the Consumer and Competition Act. <coughs> It's got the same section number, so we all know what we're talking about. And I, I, probably I'm the only person in the room old enough to be traumatised by the change of Section 52 of the Trade Practices Act to Section 18 um, of the CCA. But you can see that renumbering sections is, is, is fine as long as it's not Section 51.3. All right, so I would say that similarly fair use could be introduced as a general scheme assessing the use of copyright material against a set of fairness factors rather than trying to in, um, fit it into established fair dealing boxes. But there is a safety blanket provided by the specific exemptions at the moment. All right, the other, uh, another uh, objection to reform is the thin edge of the wedge. Um, all of these things have been said to review bodies. Don't change it, you can't change it. The public's just waiting to pounce, they're all pirates. They won't understand what is meant, um, and it will be um, a more difficult environment for copyright owners. All right, now here's um, a little bit about, I guess, the title of the talk, virtual, Virtue Signalling and Using Mass Hysteria as a Tactic. Um, another barrier to reform is the harnessing of well, what I've called here mass hysteria, among those allegedly affected by the reforms. And there is a lot of virtue signalling, uh, particularly in newspaper articles, that's the text bit, um, but also in submissions to reviews, another bit of text. Um, most of it, though, takes part in the public arena to scare politicians. It's, it's not really meant, I don't think, to constitute serious argument. Now. You probably all know what virtue signalling is. It's become a cliché, but I'm just going to read you the Oxford Dictionary definition. It means the action or practice of publicly expressing opinion or sentiments intended to demonstrate one's good character or the moral correctness of one's position on a particular issue. And there's a great deal of virtue signalling with respect to intellectual property and, in particular, copyright reform. And the virtues signalled are... We want to protect the integrity of creative output. We want to acknowledge and respect authorship and creation. We believe in a decent income for creators, and there must be the maintenance of incentives for creation and dissemination. Another virtue is determining piracy, and another one is demonstrating a greater understanding of the real issues of life than do law reformers including the so-called Productivity Commission, which um, you may have seen referred to in those terms uh, in newspapers. Okay, so stere the stereotyping part is um, that some of these arguments against reform are not really all that interested in the virtues that are being signalled. Um, Ross Garno has said that in the past decade, lobby groups are becoming less inhibited in pursuing private interests at the, expense, at the expense of the wider public interest and are ferociously resistant to reform proposals involving private costs to them. And what we do see is media and lobbying campaigns run alongside inquiries. And at times, um, there is, in my opinion, um, and the opinion of many others, um, I suppose the lies part, the misleading information that is intended to derail any reform through complaint across a wide range of matters. Um, 
I'll just tell you a little bit about what we saw at the ALRC. The ALRC received 400 form letters, more than 400 form letters from teachers and 18 form letters from publishers, actually, um, and authors. And the letters uh, clearly showed that people had not read the discussion paper that they were complaining about. But feelings were running very high about proposals which had not, in fact, been made. And people had been told that they would be deprived of their rightful income. I was dreadfully concerned when I was informed that the ALRC is proposing to do away with copyright payments to authors. Um, I can see the extreme disadvantage I would be in if copyright legislation is overturned. Um, what I found interesting is that a lot of the form letters were cut and pasted verbatim. So we got a number of letters that said, I am a teacher of XX years experience, or I am a secondary slash primary teacher, strike out whichever is not applicable. <laughs> And a remarkable number used the stock phrase from the form letter, I create something from nothing using my time and creativity with apparently no sense of irony. And once, <laughs> once I'd read that 400 times, I, <laughs> I wasn't very impressed with their creativity or indeed intellect. Okay, um, now in, in its report on um, in its report on IT pricing, the House of Representatives looked at economic research and noted that the impact of infringement on copyright owners was much less severe than was claimed, and that household spending on entertainment, growth in employment in the entertainment industry, and the number of creative works being introduced has grown at a tremendous rate. The Productivity Commission was also very unimpressed with the evidence presented to it. So, that's another of the objections. There is no evidence. One of the arguments made against reform is that there is no evidence um, of, there's no evidence that reform is needed. Um, I think evidence is used in the sense there of actual data that shows what would happen if the change were made. Uh, th there are, of course, many, many submissions on both sides um, giving lots of examples, um, but that's not the sort of evidence that is, is referred to here. Um, ironically, though, the arguments that commercial um, interests and the commercial environment will be damaged is, is asserted without, again, the evidence to back it up. So review bodies and their reports are often classified as a theoretical exercise without recognition of commercial realities. That's a quote from one submission to the ALRC. There is very little evidence around, and not surprisingly, um, it is quoted very selectively and instrumentally. Um, the ALRC, in our report, we actually cited every bit of economic evidence we could find um, on the reform proposals put forward, especially with respect to fair dealing or fair use. Um, we noted that Nearly all of it was commissioned by stakeholders. There, there's very little you know, pure research that um, doesn't have some sort of agenda. Um, however, one of the favourite criticisms of the ALRC report is that it completely ignored evidence and did not mention any research. And we've had that repeated to us quite a few times. Admittedly, there's not a lot, but what there was, we did cite. And, and we do show people that in the report if we're asked, if we're told. Okay, so there is another objection to reform, and that is transaction costs. And it's, it's absolutely true that uncertainty and business cost can result from law reform. Uh, Section 51.3, the rules on parallel importing and fair use have one thing in common. They advocate a market-based deregulated approach, which allows for the operation of competition factors or, in the case of fair use, fairness factors. To that end, it may take a while to adapt and consider if things need to be done differently. And there's no doubt that there are costs involved in business adapting to regulatory changes. Uh, and this is a genuine, uh, uh, a genuine objection to reform. Uh, it is the reason, really, that the Ergus Review, all those years ago, 
um, did not recommend the introduction of fair use. At that time, it was felt the transaction costs would be too high. However, and reviews find this and they report on it, much commercial behaviour is already conducted in a way where practices are agreed on. And we would argue, the AORC argued, that fair use provides greater scope for this. And views differ as to whether transaction costs would be higher or lower if Australia moves into a fair use environment. And you will know that the Productivity Commission um, looked at this and did not think the transaction costs would be significant. And there were hundreds of submissions agreeing with them. Well, how, how can we know? Well, there is a body of Australian case law which discusses some or all of the factors relevant to assessing fair use. Australian courts can and do have recourse to overseas precedent. And codes and guidelines have been developed in the US and are already in place in some industries here. And I would go so far as to say that um, most of the sport, sporting codes um, have developed their own version of fair use. Um, they take the fair dealing provisions and they work out by agreement what it is that um, they think constitutes a reasonable use of other people's intellectual property in reporting the news, for example. So it's not just reporting the news, it's actually um, this is what we think is fair in this context. All right, so what are the next steps? Um, more evidence gathering. Um, New Zealand is going to an evidence-based review. They're obviously very worried about being accused of having no evidence for any reform recommendations. Um, there's going to be looking at uh, economies where fair use has been introduced, and many innovative um, economies do have it. Um, work is being done on communicating the reality of copyright and copyright law reform to creators and trying to cut through the misrepresentation that does occur. And I refer here to Rebecca's work in particular with her grant um, in which she is looking at um, a great number of things, including um, what is it that creators understand about copyright. Okay, and finally, I'm going to quote my friend Henry Ergus, who's an economist. Um, he says, eventually, reform will come. He said, there will be the stages of grief. There will be denial, <laughs> anger, bargaining, depression, but finally acceptance. So, um, and, and I think we are seeing um, a hopeful picture emerging, and there will be more reform. And we're going to hear more about that um, later today. So thank you very much. And any questions? And we are, of course, running behind, but that's the sign of a great uh, forum. So I tried uh, we'll to have a few questions. I know you're excellent. Mm. Um, questions. That was a wonderful overview, of course, of the background and the reasons why we don't take more bolder leaps than uh, you know might be asked. Any mm. questions, particular for Jill? <laughs> I, I have a question just to mm. keep you from your coffee mm. because I'm a terrible person, mm. um, uh, which is that, so you didn't want to look forward, uh, but do you personally have any hopes for this, uh, for the reviews that are going to be um, run this year, which are specifically for those who haven't heard about Orphan Works, uh, mm. con copyright and contracts and yeah. exceptions and limitations yeah. as an omnibus? The short answer is yes. Uh, I, I, I do. I'm very hopeful. I think it's... I think these reviews are taking a number of elements of the Productivity Commission, the ALRC and others, well, mainly those two, and are, are seriously looking at them. And I think they indicate government buy-in. Um, the reason I hesitate to comment too much is because I know we are going to hear um, from the government about this, uh, from the department. Um, but, but no, I think there is um, you know, a serious engagement with a lot of the issues that have come out. And um, th there's not, in, in my opinion, although I would say that, wouldn't I, there's not a lot of downside in looking particularly at the orphan works, um, which has, has progressed quite a lot already. Um, and I, I can't see anything wrong with fair use either. <laughs> and, and I know that's not um, 
what the government is calling it. But no, I, I think the picture is looking good. In fact, I was conscious while preparing this that I was looking back and I kept saying over the last 20 years and I thought, <laughs> how old am I? Um, but, um, you know, I think the phenomena I've mentioned uh, as to the objections to reform may well continue. But, uh, but certainly Marrakesh is a big, a big um, step forward. You know, it took a long time to sort of think about that, digest it, and introduce it for uh, Australia. So, yes, I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does feel to me a bit like we're moving beyond discussions about whether or not some of these things are good ideas and more mm. about how they could be how they have to do in it. good ways, which mm. is a fundamentally different conversation, which is nice. Mm. Um, any other questions? Here we go. Uh, Kia ora, um, James Tingibut from Internet New Zealand. You've um, got my country up on there saying we're going to do an evidence-based review. Sorry, you, you are going to? Uh, yes, so well, so we have, we have terms of reference from the government. Um, yeah. I'm independent, we, oh. we run, the, run the registry and we're engaging and facilitating mm. conversation as part of that. And that's um, what I'm interested in. You've, you've participated in a, a number of these processes and you highlight the role that fear and other emotions can can play in them. Well, I, I was asked to do a conference talk, so I thought I'd... Well, <laughs> sure, sure. So, um, yeah, it, what, it is true, though, yeah. What, what I'd like to know is if you have any ideas about how the, the process could be structured or how civil society organisations like my own could engage in that to um, help guide that in as constructive... Mm. Uh, as possible a direction and process? Mm. Well, thank you for that question. <laughs> Just a short one before morning tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, the organisations like yours um, make very powerful submissions to reviews. Um, and particularly, well, let me just give you one example. The, um, there's an organisation which Microsoft, among others, uh, it's a software a sort of uh, you, you know, omnibus software um, industry organisation, and I, I, I know the name of it as well as anything, I just can't think of it at this time in the morning. Jessica, coffee. Um, but um, what, 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 happened with, um, what happened with that organisation was that, um, first of all, they objected to fair use. You know, we object, it's no good. We've, Microsoft told us that Windows 10 allowed multiple users, they were responding to the market. You know, this is, this is all interesting. And then after the discussion paper came out, they changed their mind and they said, actually, we think fair use to be fine and it's not going to do any damage. And what they'd done is talk among their members and get a consensus. But when I said that evidence is usually... Uh, ev the sort of evidence that... Um, reform bodies are told they don't have is statistics and data. But, of course, the submissions are a huge amount of evidence. So when organisations say, we get together and we talk about this and this is what we've come up with, that, that is evidence. So making constructive submissions, not too long. They don't have to be long. No, I'm, I'm not joking. I think even a one-page, um, as long as it's not a form letter, uh, even, a, even a, a, a short submission... Um, just drawing attention to salient points is, is very powerful. So that is, um, that, that is the way to do it. Um, I, I, I didn't mean to put evidence-based review in inverted commas. I'm not suggesting it won't be evidence-based. But um, uh, one, one, of the, one of the difficulties is that it, it's so hard to do research. You know, how can you know what the counterfactual is when you haven't had it? Um, and also, all the research is very segmented, very industry specific. It's not possible really to say, you know, the whole copyright world thinks this. It's going to be, you know, books will drop a little bit in price if parallel importing is changed, um, which happened, of course. So, um, it, it, you know, it is very difficult to to gather data on a, on a huge um, platform, I think. Mm-hmm.